Okay, so the next vocab word I want to introduce is really important. A lot of you are going into biology or medicine, and um, this concept is one of the most pivotal ideas in both of those fields. So the phrase is, I'm going to move my back over there. <laughs> the phrase is buffer. So we use this phrase in everyday language kind of in a little bit of a different way. You might say uh, like that your computer or YouTube is buffering, right? That kind of means like taking time to load up the data. Um, you might say that a person is acting as a social buffer between you and someone else. Maybe you don't get along with someone else. So you want a friend nearby to help smooth out anything awkward, right? And so the technical definition of a buffer is that it's just a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid that's in water. Th that's not very helpful as a definition, but like if you, if you Google it, that's what you're going to see, some version of that. What's more helpful is to think about how it applies to what we use in everyday language. So when you're saying something is buffering, what you mean is you are trying to get a relatively smooth experience, whether it's your internet connection or it is, you know, social. Um, that's what a buffer does chemically. So in this context, smooth means the pH is not dramatically changing. And that turns out to be super important in so many systems. Um, the ocean equilibria that we looked at, need to be at a certain pH and not change dramatically or else every time a fish pooped, it would kill everybody in the area and that would obviously not be great. Um, so buffers are critical everywhere in nature and uh, including your body, which works on the same buffer system as the ocean does. And the reason they're critical is because if you have even very small changes in concentrate uh, in pH actually, if you have small changes in pH, it means very large changes in concentrations of stuff, all right? And when that happens, proteins and um, other biological molecules don't function the way that they're supposed to. Um, that's as true for fish as it is for us. So for humans, our blood pH needs to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. So the average is 7.4. If you're below that, we call it acidosis. Acidosis happens um, most often for diabetic patients whose diabetes is not managed or they aren't aware that they have it because basically the metabolism gets out of control and the metabolic breakdown of food is an acidic process. So acid just keeps building up as your body tries to compensate for um, basically for not having insulin. Um, that's bad. That damages organs. It can lead to all kinds of organ failures and even death. Um, just for your reference, one of the symptoms of this is, is frequently going to the bathroom. So uh, your body ends up building up so much acid and the body tries to get rid of it by activating your kidneys and making, uh, making people urinate more frequently to try to get the pH balance back on order. Um, there are other mechanisms too that try to help fight acidosis. Acidosis is one of the sort of, we have about four different buffer systems that help to mitigate that as much as it can. But when things are really, really awry, as in the case of a diabetic patient, um, you, have to, you have to step in, you have to fix it medically. Um, so that'd be an emergency situation. Less commonly are situations where people's blood pH is higher than 7.45. I actually don't know of anything that can cause that. It's a possibility, but um, I'm not sure. Maybe eating Tide Pods. Don't try it. <laughs> but anyway, um, actually that's not even true. So there's another myth around the world that, and the internet mostly, that what you eat affects your blood pH and that is completely wrong. There is no connection between your food and your pH of your blood. Um, the buffers in your blood do a really good job of maintaining an even pH under normal circumstances. Um, so what you eat is gonna be acidically decomposed in your stomach anyway. So 
you know, drinking like alkaline water doesn't influence your blood pH at all. There's no connection. I'm sorry if you've been paying a lot of money for water. Also, if you really like alkaline water, it's just baking soda and water. So save you some money. <laughs> all right. So here's how buffers work. You have to have the conjugate acid and base present at the same time. Okay. And so if I add a base to my buffer system, remember that these are present in relatively similar concentrations, say like one mole and one mole. Okay. Uh, which of course is going to make the pH higher than it would have been if we just put in the acetic acid. So we put in acetic acid and around the same amount of, of sodium acetate and we'll get a nice buffer. So that means it won't have a dramatic change in pH. Here's why that's true. So if I add a base, okay, so if I add base, the quest, so that's OH minus, right? If I add base, what would this react with? And so we need to think about the concentrations of things. All right, and so this is an acid, and so is this. But if you do your calculation, um, in order for this to be at equilibrium and have relatively equal amounts of these two things, this H plus has to be in a really low amount, right? So like, let's just say we have 0.1 mole of this, 0.1 mole of this. You could do this calculation yourself using an ice table, sort of like our beginning problem, but I'll do it as well. You can check. Okay, so I did it real quick up here um, with just kind of the end of, that's my equilibrium position. So it's 0.1 molar divided by 0.1 molar. So these are gonna cancel out nicely. And actually it turns out the concentration of acid of H plus as an acid is very small compared to the amount of acetic acid that you put in there. Okay, so it's very small. So when we think about which, which acidic thing the hydroxide is likely to run into first, it's gonna be the most concentrated one. And that's gonna be our acid over here, not just the H plus, cause you know, just statistically, if you think about these molarities, you're, you're much more likely to run into an acetic acid than you are into an H plus. So that's what we're going to assume happens. We're going to assume that the most concentrated thing is what is going to react. So um, if that's true, so what's going to happen is that the acetic acid and the hydroxide are going to react together, right? So these react together. And of course, we remember from our equilibrium experiment that that means uh, we're decreasing the amount um, of acetic acid that's present for the equilibrium to use. Well, that's okay because this is an equilibrium, right? So if we decrease a reactant, it's going to cause the equilibrium to shift to the left and we will make more of that material. So what we've just observed is adding a base, which we would normally say should increase the pH, actually um, will only increase the pH a little bit because the OH minus reacts with the acetic acid. And when we shift to the left, this will decrease the amount of hydrogen ion present, but by a much smaller amount than if we had just dumped hydroxide in and it did not have an acid to react with, okay? So same logic, but this time we're gonna apply it to an acid, right? So if we add an H plus, the question is, what happens. So we're looking at the, uh, at the equation again and we're going to figure out what is the most likely thing to react, remembering that H plus is still quite low in concentration uh, compared to the other two. And so H plus and H plus are probably not going to react together, right? Same charge. Uh, this is also an acid, so probably not going to react together, which means the H plus is going to react with the uh, acetate. When that happens, so normally we add acid, we expect the pH to go down, but in this case, it's not going to go by down by as much because the H plus we're adding is being reacted with acetate, which means the equilibrium is going to shift to the right to replace it. So some of that H plus is going to be 
present, but it, it shifts to a much smaller degree than how much H plus we added in. Now, another thing people realize frequently is that, okay, if we're reacting acetate and hydrogen, I'm making this. So the other perspective, whether you think about decreasing the acetate concentration or increasing the acetic acid, it's the same logic, right? Both of those are gonna cause the reaction to shift to the right. So it does a little bit, but the original amount of H plus that we added in um, is not gonna be entirely replaced by shifting because our, our Ka value is very small. So it only shifts a little bit. That's how you get a buffer. That's how you maintain a relatively stable pH. So back to these slides again from uh, chapter 15. Each one of these reactions is important in buffering the pH of the ocean. And so um, in the next video, I'm gonna tell you about the recommendation from my mentor when I was in college that led to this fish tank. So stay tuned.